<laughs> Israel is only Pfizer, right? No, I think they also have Moderna. I think they also, oh, they have, okay. but, but, but I think it's in Israel. No, there is no Moderna in Israel. Yes, I think that, of course. No, no, no. They returned a million and a half doses of Moderna. Ah, okay. I didn't know that. Why? Because no, they had enough of... Because they made an agreement with Pfizer to give Pfizer all the information and in return to get a lot of doses. Okay. All right. Because I remember that that at some point uh, there was, it was in the news that now also the Moderna uh, uh, vaccine uh, arrived in Israel. No, but they, they they are not using it. They returned all the doses as far as right. I know. Okay. Yeah. Maybe sure. And tomorrow is election day here in Israel. Yeah, yeah. But I heard that the, the chances are, are high that, that Netanyahu again gets the majority somehow. Yeah, I think this is a constant thing. I think his chances are always high, irrespective of what he does. <laughs> Hi, Don. Hi. Hey, how are you, Don? Hey, Jose. So, how are things? Not so bad. Not so bad. How are things with you? Things are well. For postponing my, I don't have any more excuse. I just got the second shot this morning. I just came right home. Oh, very good. Very good. This is crazy because they put a the time, you have to be there exactly the time they do it because it's a drive through. So they have all time to the minute. Oh, cool. So, what's the turnover? How many do they do per hour? They do, they basically, each spot there's about one, one every minute and a half. Oh, wow. They have like three people, one that get this paperwork and then they, you know, but it's like a, a line. And then you park your car somewhere so no, they no, can no, make no, sure no. that you don't... They just come to your window. You open the window, they give you the shot. You close and the window and you go. <laughs> you drive off. Okay. I mean, my parents had to wait 15 minutes after the shot before they were allowed to. Yes, you have to wait. You, you, you wait there with the car, you sit around. And <coughs> okay, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. And then you can decide which arm you want it on by where you sit in the car. No, but Israel and the U.S. seem to be doing pretty well at getting um, shots, or, uh, vaccines distributed. Yeah, certainly much more efficient. It really increased the, the yeah. production a lot. I think that's the only thing that Biden did right. Also, he got uh, companies work with Moderna to, you know, competing companies to produce it. They really put a little bit of uh, high production. So I think the look at the situation now, they should have everybody vaccinated in the U.S. by end of May. Hmm. They, they tell that by end of April, there's going, not going to be any more limitation by age or by disease, whatever. Everybody can apply, right? So the only thing funny about the US is a very cumbersome because lots of people give the vaccine. So it's not like there's a one control way. Like my son teaches in a middle school and all the pharmacies can give vaccine for teachers because that's what Biden did. But that the federal, for somehow the federal government control vaccine. So HB, there's a local grocery store, has a pharmacy. So they went to my son's school. I think they dealt with the school and they vaccinated all the teachers at the school. But it's very funny, like uh, different people do different ways. Yeah. Now let's see if this damn thing works. That's the real question. <laughs> How did you <laughs> test this? <laughs> Will you test it on yourself? No. I think the most, the most interesting part is that if you reduce the amount of virus circulation, right? That's going to be the real test, right? It's not like a... My, my guess is the Russians have already tested it on some prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> but they only gave placebo to the prisoners. <laughs> Maybe. So they don't have the other control group. They want to take the back. <laughs> Russians don't test their vaccines, they just use them. <laughs> that, it's possible, you know. Dima, how are you? Hey, how are you guys? Hi. Hey, Yerig, just want to say hello from Boulder. Yeah, thank you. Hello. <laughs> how are you doing? Yeah, 
Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous today with my talk. <laughs> oh, no, it'll be great, I'm sure. Yeah, but I mean, there have been such fantastic talks before me, so it's going to be very, very hard to match it. <laughs> so, Jörg, what, what's Göttingen like in terms of uh, pandemic? Are, you know, Oh, you know, I mean, Göttingen, getting shots? Mm -hmm. Göttingen is doing surprisingly well compared to Germany. We have something like three, five times less incidence rates than, than the average in Germany. So here the university is something like a safe haven. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, but, uh, but Germany in, in general is not doing so well. Mm. Well, yeah, the, the COVID in the U.S. keeps, you know, it, it's got a, a phase delay between every student vacation or holiday and yeah. then there's this, this burst that comes and so right now we're in the um, sort of the spring break uh, for many universities N mm. not Colorado by the way uh, and so people are anticipating that in two weeks there's going to be another another little bump or spike or whatever yeah how are things down in rice that way Well, I don't know. I haven't been out of the house virtually for a year, so I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think uh, Texas as a whole is doing uh, so well, but that's because we have... The know, numbers are small now, but not because they do things right, they think by luck, but let's see what happens now that they open a little bit. Rice yeah. has been doing reasonably well because uh, uh, the people that are going on campus they are, and they, they're not all the students, the students have the choice. So you have about half of the students on campus and all this stuff. And they are testing everybody every week and some risk groups twice a week. So they're right. keeping pretty close tabs if anything uh, gets out of hand. Now, what do you believe you don't believe? They believe that all the cases that they caught haven't been transmitted internally, but, but that has to go with tracing and stuff like that. So I don't know if you can be, believe on this or oh, 100% on that, but I think they have been pretty good because of the internal testing on what's yeah. happening there. Okay, I guess we have to start. Okay. So, uh, yeah, welcome everybody to the Protein Folding and Dynamics webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have with us today uh, Jörg Enderlein from Gettingen. Before I present uh, Jörg, uh, I would like to take a few minutes uh, to talk about one of the, uh, the pillars of the protein folding field who passed away very recently, uh, Robert Buzz Baldwin. Um, so uh, I think uh, many of you uh, know Baldwin or uh, were exposed with work, uh, I actually learned quite a bit about him today while reading his autobiography in the uh, annual reviews of biophysics. Uh, Buzz uh, was born in 1927 in Wisconsin and he actually did most of his initial career in Wisconsin. He was educated there. He even became an assistant professor in 1955 in uh, uh, University of Wisconsin. And then in 1959, he moved to Stanford where he has been a professor and then an emeritus professor until his death. Uh, he was a member of the National Academy of Science. He received many prizes, including the Stein and Moore Award, the Founders Award of the Biophysical Society, and uh, many more. Uh, it was interesting to discover that uh, Buzz started working on protein folding following a lecture that Cy Leventhal gave in 1968 in uh, Stanford uh, and uh, Sai uh, Leventhal was talking about his uh, paradox and then Paul Flory leaned over to Buzz and he said to him, there must be folding intermediates. And so uh, Buzz started looking for these intermediates. He set up uh, the apparatus to do fast kinetic studies on uh, folding and showed the first uh, uh, observations of intermediates in RNAs A and other proteins. He then went on to look at the uh, helical propensity of peptides and he showed that peptides can form helices in solution even without a protein around them. Uh, he, used the, uh, he showed that the helix coil theory uh, predicts correctly uh, what happens in uh, real life experiments. And in the 80s, he introduced pulse hydrogen exchange methods to look again at intermediates of folding. 
There were many, many more achievements from his lab, but one of the most uh, amazing contributions of his lab of, uh, and of Buzz, of course, was- Ilan, the... I'm only seeing a gray screen from you. Do you have anything else here? You're supposed to see a picture of Buzz, actually. You don't now see I that? See. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, sorry if you don't see that. Uh, now uh, I see do it. other people see the picture or you see no, it? Now it's fine. I don't now see it. Fine. Now it's not. Oh, really? Okay. No, I, I see it now. Yeah. And now you don't see it? What do you see now? No, no, it's yeah. okay. Yeah, it just appeared. Okay. Yeah, I... Okay. So, I, uh, as I said, one of the uh, most amazing uh, contributions of Buzz to the uh, scientific world was the large number of uh, students and postdocs who uh, were educated in his lab and went out to become uh, um, amazing scientists. I don't want to uh, make to uh, name all of them. Some of them are actually frequent participants in this webinar, like uh, Susan Marcusi and others. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's really one of the things that will remain for many years uh, from the memory of, uh, uh, of Buzz, including uh, the wonderful science that he, uh, he left behind. Uh, so with that, I guess we can uh, move to today's speaker. And I would like to mention that today's talk is a joint uh, uh, event together with the Biophysical Society's Biophysics Week, which is, which is this week. So uh, in order to... Uh, um, celebrate this Biophysics Week, we decided to invite uh, Jörg Enderlein, who kind of uh, bridges uh, the two worlds, the world of uh, biophysical methodology and the world of protein folding and dynamics. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jörg. Uh, perhaps now I will move back to the photo of Jörg. Yes. Oops. So uh, Jörg uh, actually did his PhD in the Humboldt University in Berlin. He then postdoc at the Los Alamos National Laboratory together with uh, Richard Keller, who was one of the pioneers of single molecule spectroscopy. Uh, uh, and then uh, he became an assistant professor in Regensburg and later on also in the Ulich uh, Research Center. And since 2008, he's a professor of biophysics at the University of Göttingen. Uh, he's actually right now the Dean of uh, the Faculty of Physics in the university. Apparently this is his last week and he's very happy about that. Uh, Jörg holds a, uh, an advanced um, European uh, Research Council uh, grant, which is a very prestigious uh, grant. And he was also just uh, nominated to be the editor in chief of the new, <clears throat> of the new journal of the uh, Biophysical Society, which is called Biophysical Reports, uh, and I wish him a lot of luck in this uh, new position. Jörg is a master of the uh, uh, single molecule technique. He has developed many, many important techniques that all of us practitioners in the field are using. Uh, among these techniques are imaging techniques like super resolution optical imaging, SOFI, image scanning microscopy, orientational, orientational imaging of single molecules, two focus correlation spectroscopy, fluorescence lifetime correlation spectroscopy, and many, many more techniques. Uh, Jörg is going to tell us about some of uh, this work and perhaps a newer uh, methodology that he's developed in his lab. And his talk is titled Advanced Fluorescence Correlation Spectroscopy for measure, Measuring Molecular Conformation and Dynamics. So Jörg, I will stop sharing, uh, sharing my screen and let you share your screen. Let me just add, for one moment that uh, please uh, all of you keep your uh, microphones mute. Uh, at the end of the talk, we will have a uh, question and answer session. So each of you uh, who has a question, please write in the chat that you have a question. I will ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so with that, uh, I will stop here and Georg, you're welcome to start. Yeah, thank you very much, Gilad. And uh, of course, Gilad and Ben and Hagen, thank you so much for inviting me here to this webinar. And I hope I can, can live up to the expectations. So I, I want to present here today a few of our correlation spectroscopy methods which we have developed over the past 20 years. 
and uh, it will be a mixture of old stuff. I hope it's not too boring for the more experienced among you and some, some newer developments. So let me start <clears throat> generally what, what is uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So of course, <clears throat> the, the workhorse for FCS is shown here, it's a confocal microscope. So what you see here <clears throat> is, um, is, the, um, is, a, is a normal confocal microscope where you have the excitation laser here, it's a dichroic mirror, you are focusing your laser into your sample, typically it's a solution of diffusing molecules, <clears throat> you are collecting with the same object of your fluorescence and then you are, for a pinhole, you are imaging them onto single photon um, sensitive detectors. What is important here, and please keep it in mind, we usually use uh, polarization dissolved detection, which will be important um, then more later in my talk. So when we now place here on top of our microscope a solution, a diluted solution of fluorescent molecules, what we then can observe is the following. When these molecules are diffusing in solution through the detection volume, which is the cigar-like thing here, and which is determined basically by the focusing of my laser and also by the confocal detection along the z-axis, then the fluorescent signal I can record <clears throat> as intensity over time is heavily fluctuating if the concentration my solution is sufficiently low. Typically, we are working in picomolar to nanomolar concentration range. So from this kind of very stochastic signal, what I can do is then I do a two, two photon or two point correlation analysis. So I'm simply asking, okay, what is the chance to see, let's say sometime later, the fluorescence photon, if there was a fluorescence photon sometime before, and I can do it for all kind of lag times. And then what I'm getting is this uh, famous uh, fluorescence correlation curve, which is shown here. And this is somehow a little special because we have here a time range between something picoseconds up to seconds. So this is the full anatomy of a correlation curve. So we see here different dynamics. And let me guide you very quickly what we see in, in particular on a very <clears throat> on a very fast time scale in a range of picoseconds to nano, nanoseconds you have the so-called anti-bunching which is due to the fact that the single molecule cannot emit more than a, than a single photon within the typical average lifetime of a desired state um, then on a slightly faster as a slower time scale in the, in the order of picoseconds to a few nanoseconds we have then rotational diffusion i will talk about this later in my talk then on even slower time scale, then we see photophysics. This is this partial decay of the correlation curve in the microsecond, typically 100 nanosecond to microsecond time range. And this will play a big part in my talk today. And then, of course, then in the millisecond time range, we see then the correlation decay, which is due to translational diffusion of our molecules through the detection volume. And then at very long times, we have an offset, which is simply uncorrelated photons, which, um, which are always there. So let me first focus on the translational diffusion part because it was the starting point when we started to, to do FCS in our lab and when, when we started to, to look at it slightly deeper into the matter. So what we wanted to do in the very beginning, it's already 20 years ago, we wanted to, to use this diffusion part of the correlation curve to measure precisely and quantitatively the size of single molecules or of molecules in, in solution, as in similar what people do with dynamic light scattering with bigger particles. So the question was at that time when we started, okay, what is determining the exact shape of this, of this curve? Of course, one thing is the physics behind the diffusion coefficient, the photophysical constants and so on. But of course, also the instrumental response function is very important. And this is basically given by the so-called molecule detection function. This is shown here in this, in this animation. So the molecule detection function tells you what is the chance to see a single photon from a molecule at a given position in your sample solution? Solution. So this is here, all these coordinates are in micrometer, these are the lateral coordinates, this is the axial coordinate. And what you see here is basically something like the point spread function, what people normally call the point spread function here in FCS, it can be a little bit more complicated, but we call it the molecule detection function, but simply as a proxy, you can say it's a, micro, it's a, it's a point spread function. And this is determining the precise shape of your FCS curve. And perf, also ideally, if you would now, with the precise functional dependency of this molecule detection function as a function of the coordinate here in space, you could then quantita quant quantitatively evaluate FCS curves and, for example, extract precise numbers of molecular size with Armstrong position. 
So how, what is, what is determining this exact shape of this molecule detection function or let's say point fit function? Of course, it's the optic of our microscope. This is the numerical aperture here, for example, in this example, it's a water immersion objective with 1.2 NA. It's the working distance of the objective. Here it's a three millimeter um, focal length. The tube lens <coughs> gives you then the magnification, which is important for the confocal detection. You need to know the, the refractive index of our solution, excitation wavelength, of course, it's all wavelength dependent. The diameter of the laser beam we are coupling into an objective because this is determining the focusing of our laser. Also, the focus position in solution can be important if there is some slight mismatch in the refractive index. Emission wavelength of fluorescence, of course, magnification, which is simply the ratio between tube lens, focal length, and the working distance, and the pinhole radius, which is determining the control detection. So when we started, we were quite naive. We were thinking, OK, we can use these numbers. We can precisely calculate how this function looks like, because we are big physicists, and we have good understanding of wave optics. So we did it, and then we tried to extract diffusion coefficients from our measurements, and the result was, in, in the end, a disaster. So each time when we repeated the measurement, we got a different diffusion coefficient or a different outcome of the, of the experiment. Also, the fitting always looked perfect. And it took us a long time to, to understand that in a real FCS experiment situation, unfortunately, is much more complicated than one would like to have. And I will only mention here two effects which are really very troublesome or very difficult to handle. The first thing is the refractive index, index, index mismatch, which simply means that if your solution has a refractive index which is slightly different from the, from the refractive index where the objective is, is designed for, then you introduce aberrations into, into your image or into your excitation, and this is then deforming a molecular detection function, which is shown here for very slight differences in the refractive index. And if you don't know that this that you have this kind of mismatch, then, then you measure an FCS curve, you fit it with the ideal model, and you get an apparent diffusion coefficient, which can be really wrong. So what you see here is how this refractive index mismatch is affecting your apparent or your measured diffusion coefficient. Um, and also here detection volume, which I'm not talking about today, but simply, simply focus here on a diffusion coefficient measurement. So another really strong effect is the, the so-called optical saturation, something we completely underestimated in the beginning, which simply means because your, your fluorescence molecule is a quantum mechanical system with, with discrete states, you, you very easily can, can saturate it. And it means by, by increasing the excitation power in your, in your FCS measurement, you are starting to deform, apparently to deform this molecular detection function, because in the middle of your focus, you have more and more saturation, which is then apparently expanding your detection volume. I mean, the, the, the details you can read up in this paper, but again, what is happening is in the experiment that with increasing excitation power, you are shifting your FCS curves to longer decay times, which is then mimicking a slower diffusion curve. And this is extremely hard to handle. As an experimental example, I show you here measurements on a dye solution of Alexa 633. And even with relatively moderate total excitation power between 30 and 300 microvolts, you see a tremendous shift of your FCS curve along the time axis, lag time axis here. And please take into account it's a logarithmic time scale. So we are talking about really big shifts here. And there's a last problem in classical fluorescence correlation spectrum, uh, spectroscopy, which I call the fitting ambiguity of FCS. And this is the following fact. When people started to do FCS, of course, they had to use some kind of a model for the molecule detection function. And the simplest model you can use is something like a three-dimensional Gaussian, where X and Y are the, trans trans the transverse coordinates in your system, and Z is along the optical axis. And this, uh, you need then these two parameters, A and B, which are describing some other extent of your detection volume into these different directions. And the, the, the beauty of this very simple approximation is that you can then exactly calculate the shape of your correlation function, the diffusion, the diffusion layer part, which is shown here. So this is now the correlation function as a function of the lag time t. Uh, big D is the diffusion coefficient, and A and B are the sizes of your detection volume. And then maybe if you have some photophysics, you have other than to include some exponential term here. This is then taking, for example, into account photophysics like inter-system crossing and, and triplet state lifetime. <clears throat> but the problem is with this model, 
that even if you take something like an elephant, you can perfectly fit uh, whatever you like with this kind of parameter model. This is reminding us the famous saying from John von Neumann, with four parameters, I can fit an elephant, with five, I can make him wiggle to his trunk. Also, I don't know how Neumann could know that this FCS model has exactly four parameters. Yeah, the A, the B, the triplet state population and the triplet state decay B beta. So this was then the starting point to think more, how can, we how can we change our experiment to get rid of this ambiguity and all these uncertainties and to make it really quantitative measurement for high precision molecular sizing. The idea in the end, which then was uh, realized uh, by my uh, student Thomas Dedding at the time, was in the end quite simple, and this is shown schematically here. So what we take is our standard confocal microscope, but we are introducing a few small modifications. The first thing what we do is that we are using here not a single laser beam for excitation, but two laser beams, but they have identical wavelength, this is quite important. So in this picture here, the only difference between these two lasers is that they have orthogonal polarization. We are combining them. We are putting them for, for a waveguide <coughs> that, that is guiding the light into our, towards, our, towards our microscope. And then we focus here into our solution. The second modification you see here, this is that at this position, we are introducing a so-called differential interference contrast or normalsky prism, which has this interesting property that it is deflecting light depending on polarization. So when you now look here, we have these two orthogonal polarizations here. What it means then that the light of the first laser is, let's say, let's say deflected slightly to the right side, and the light from the second laser to the left side. <laughs> and after then focusing through the objective, then we are ending up with two shifted but identical foci into our, in our solution. This is shown here. So instead of having a single focus, we have now two overlapping but identical foci. So why, why is it good for? I mean, this is not so super spectacular, but there comes another idea. This was invented by Don, Don Lamb, which is also here today. And uh, it was an ingenious idea and he called it the pulse interleaved excitation. And this is using <coughs> uh, basically measurement on a very fast time scale. So what we always do in our measurement, we also measure for instance lifetime, we do it by, by pulse excitation and single photon counting. And what you see here now, is an experiment where we use the so-called pulse interleaved excitation, where we have these two lasers and we, they are pulsed, but the pulses are interleaved between each other. So the first laser is pulsing at time zero, then the next, uh, next repetition period, the second laser is pulsing, and the third period is the first laser again pulsing and so on. And if you look now at the nanosecond time scale of the fluorescence, then you see two very nice fluorescence decay curves. And by simply then saying, okay, everything which is ending up in the first window here in the nanosecond time scale is belonging to the first laser and all photons which are ending in the second time window here in the nanosecond time scale is belonging to the second laser. We can, by this kind of temporal measurement, now get in spatial information. We can uh, determine which photon was excited by which laser in which focus in space. So how does it then work in FCS? So back to the FCS experiment. So what we now have is we have uh, our FCS measurement, but we now have these two lasers interleaved pulsing and uh, each laser is focused at a slightly shifted position as shown here. The good thing is that the distance between these two laser focus positions is extremely well known because the Nomarski prism is, is, is a crystal. So once you have uh, calibrated the system once, then, then the, this distance between foci is never changing again. And it is also independent to all these other effects like optical saturation or uh, refractive index mismatch or whatever you have. And with this distance also, we have now a length scale an experiment which was missing before. So how, then, how does the measurement then look like? So then we do now this kind of FCS measurement and we use this kind of time window in the nanosecond time scale then to sort our photons. We can then calculate the autocorrelation curve, which is only belonging to the first focus, the blue line here, or the autocorrelation curve, which is only belonging to the second focus, the red one. They are basically identical as it must be because the focus shape is identical. But now this is the new one. We can also calculate the cross correlation curve uh, which is correlating photons from the first focus against photons from the second focus or vice versa, and this is the green curve. What you don't see here so much, of course, what you see immediately is the, that the amplitude of the, of the cross-correlation curve is lower than the autocorrelation curve, which is due to the fact that you have only a partial overlap between two foci, so that the chance 
to see uh, two photons for first from the first focus and the second from the second focus is simply lower than to have the two photons from the same focus. But what was also very important here is that the decay here of the screen curve is slightly delayed with respect to the decay of the autocorrelation curves. And this is due to the fact that when you do this kind of cross-correlation experiment, then let's say you would detect first the photon from the first focus and your molecule has to diffuse some extra distance towards the second focus before you can get also the second photon. And this extra distance, travel distance is then simply inducing here a delay in the, in the cross-correlation decay with respect to the autocorrelation decay. By using all this information and by knowing the distance between these foci, we can now super precisely calculate um, the diffusion coefficient and, and then also, of course, the size of a molecule. And what we did here, it was the very first and publication many years ago. We, we simply took uh, um, an dye R2655, we solved it in, 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 a, in a salt, um, in a high salt uh, solution. Yeah, we increase the, the salt concentration to increasing the viscosity. What you see here is the, is a plot of the diffusion coefficient uh, as a function of the inverse viscosity. From Stokes-Einstein, you would expect that this is on a, on a straight line. Indeed, all the dual focus measurements are perfectly fitting this uh, Stokes-Einstein relation. And even beyond, we then uh, reference it against NMR measurements, so pulse field gradient NMR in methanol, and we see still the same, the same extrapolation. Whereas when you do standard conventional FCS, of course, with increasing viscosity, and that means also with increasing refractive index and then aberration, your measurements will go out uh, of sync more and more. So the sensitivity of the method is really remarkable. This is, for example, an example where we simply then measured all kinds of dye we had in the lab. This is Ato 655, Sci 5, Alexa 633, 647. But please pay attention here that this is the same dye, only the side group is slightly different. Here's an carboxyl group. Here's an NHS ester malamide. We can indeed uh, easily distinguish between these side groups, although also the changes in size are really very, very, very small. However, of course, now we have a good method for measuring molecular sizes in absolute manner with extremely high sensitivity and without any further need of calibration. But this is, of course, no dynamics yet. So what we wanted to do the next is to use the FCS for really looking at dynamics of, of biomolecules. I mean, here in this, in this, in this uh, <coughs> webinar, of course, I have not to explain you how you can measure conform conformational fluctuations or dynamics of proteins or peptides with something like first resonance and energy transfer. So I will not at all touch that because this would, there, we had fantastic talks here by, by many people like Ben Schuler, Hagen, or, or Gleaton, uh, showing how you can use FRET for, for, for protein folding measurements. But I want to focus here a little bit on, on an alternative which is full induced electron transfer, not an alternative, but let's say a, a compl complementary method, um, which we used because in the beginning, when we started to, to use, uh, or when we wanted to look into the dynamics of, of molecules, we started with very small peptides. And for a long time, we had really huge problems to, to double label them for first resonance energy transfer. So we were looking for alternatives where we can use a more easy labeling uh, approach to, to do some, something similar. And uh, the method then we found was photoinduced electron transfer. So what, what is it? How does it work? So in photoelectron, photoinduced electron transfer or PET, <coughs> um, the idea is quite simple. So let's say you have a small peptide, you intrinsically disordered peptide, and you want to measure the conform conformation dynamics of this peptide in the nanosecond to microsecond time scale. So what we do is we are labeling with only one single die at the end which is uh, the special dye ATO 655, which is important, but because only this dye more or less shows this very nice effect, I will tell you in a minute. <clears throat> and then somewhere in your peptide, you need one tryptophan. It's important that you have only one tryptophan because the idea is the following. As, as long as the dye is far away from the tryptophan, then you can nicely excite this fluorescence and you see a very good fluorescence signal. However, if by chance your peptide forms a loop and the, the dye and your tryptophan come in close contact, and close contact means you really that they are touching each other, that they really overlap between electron orbitals, then <clears throat> there is a very efficient um, electron transfer from the dye to the tryptophan 
which is then quenching the dye fluorescence by 100% and the dye turns dark. So what you then see when you do an FCS experiment is because you have this transitions, these reversible transitions between this open state and this closed state, what you then would expect in an FCS experiment is a partial decay of the correlation function with a time signature, which is exactly this dynamics, this K plus, K minus dynamics of this loop formation and loop opening again. The method was uh, um, initially, I would say, pioneered by, by Marcus Sauer. It was a, a very far, one of the very first publications in 2003, where we use it for looking at P53 uh, fragment uh, dynamics. But then we wanted to go uh, recently um, uh, into more detail. We were investigating uh, uh, the, the peptide dynamics of this model, intrinsically disordered model peptide uh, GS repeat. <laughs> So what we have is these glucine serine repeats. We also introduce one tryptophan, as I said, in a specific position. This is shown here. And on the other, other end, we have an ATO 655. So we have the flu for here and the quencher on the other end. And then we have here these GS repeats. And we looked at, uh, at the repeats between 5 and 20. And again, so what we measure is then, or what we want to measure with FCS is then this, the dynamics, this uh, loop formation and loop opening with this method. <coughs> so the, um, the measurement looks like this one. This is a typical example. So here what you see is now different FCS measurements on different samples where we have, uh, for example, here the green curve is the pure R0655. This is pure dye solution. Then the red curve would be the peptide with no, <coughs> with no tryptophan inserted. So then you see simply a shifted diffusion related uh, FCS curve, which is slightly um, then uh, the longer decay time because the peptide is bigger than the pure dye. But then the beauty is that indeed both curves are identical modular scaling of the time axis. And then when we put uh, tryptophan inside the peptide at different distances from, from the end, from the, from the, from the dye, the 10 amino acids, 20, 30, 40, 50, then we see with, uh, with, with shorter and shorter distances between tryptophan and dye that we see more and more this very fast partial decay of our correlation curve due to this loop formation dynamics. And by repeating these experiments for the different uh, positions of tryptophan, we can systematically map through a peptide. So what we then see in the end is something like that. We have then here, we can calculate the contact rate or so the loop formation rate as a function of the distance between the dye and the tryptophan here in the number of amino acids, uh, starting here from 10 somewhere up to over 40. This is one information, but then again, what we also did, uh, we, oh, okay, before coming to that, uh, also what we also did, we did one small modification, which is quite interesting. We also then extended our peptide beyond the quencher position with the so-called tail. It was a five repeat of this GS. And uh, something which I did not expect in the beginning is that then also the contact rate formation between the ADO and the tryptophan is heavily changed and to, to smaller values. So I, must, I have to say in the, in the beginning, I was really naive and was expecting that, that something like this tail beyond the tryptophan position would not affect so much this loop formation of the other, other part here. This is one information, but then we also used our, <coughs> our dual focus FCS. This was then done by Arinda and Gosch to measurement. We used the dual focus FCS also to measure very precisely the hydrodynamic the dynamic radius of our peptides. Uh, this is schematically shown here. Um, and then we had uh, basically the second then measure set of, set of measurements for the different constructs where we have again here now as a function of the total length of amino acids and, uh, and, uh, and the hydrodynamic radius of our peptides. So we did it for different total lengths of peptides, different distances, uh, different uh, also tail, with tail or without tail and so on. Uh, in the end, of course, we had a huge uh, measurement set, but the problem was that we, of course, wanted to learn something from it. So we went to our colleagues here in Göttingen to the, to the molecular dynamics uh, department, and we were asking them, okay, can you help us with modeling this kind of dynamics uh, on, on, on your computer? And the answer was then somehow like, uh, not really. The problem is, if you look here at these rates, we are talking about loop formation rates in the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. So for, for example, for only calculating one experiment or for modeling one of these experiments, you would need something like it's at least um, 10 microsecond, 100 microsecond uh, model time for getting a good statistics of this loop formation dynamics. 
So for, for reproducing all our measurement, it would take a few years to do all the calculations. So that's why we, are st we started then to look into something simpler, whether we can somehow model our, our experiment by a simple point dynamic simulation um, approach. And this is what I'm telling you now, is was all done by my, my PhD student, Stefan Müller, um, in, at the time. <coughs> An idea was to model our peptides by a very simple bead, uh, bead chain as shown here. So what are the then details of the speed of the speed model? So what we what did we take into account? So each of these beads has a has a hydrodynamic radius, which is this A1, and the flu four is a bigger one than the amino acids. So the amino acids were considered to be identical. We have a distance between them, which is a geometric parameter. We have also um, an excluded excluded volume, and it's important to understand that the excluded volume of all these beads can be different than from the hydrodynamic radius. So we have these two independent parameters. And then, of course, we have uh, we took into account hydrodynamic interactions. We took into account excluded volume effects. Uh, we then Im impose some bending energy, which is determining in the end uh, <coughs> the persistence length of our, our peptide. And we also took into account the, the, spe the special properties of the flu for that it has a different hydrodynamic radius and uh, also different distance from the, from the first amino acid. So the, the model, so the three parameters in the end, what, what we had in our model, we have only two numbers. This is the dynamic speed size and the bending stiffness. These, these are really the, 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 the model parameters which, which are really adjusted. So the dynamics was then modeled with uh, standard Brownian dynamics. So here's the Angelai equation. Here's, a, here's basically the B is a diffusion, is a one out of the diffusion tensor. Here are the stochastic forces. Here's uh, the term describing then the, the, ener the energy of your peptide. We had then even to modify a little bit to take into account also the non-extensibility constraint and also some entropic term, which is then taking into account some, I would say, the, the hidden degrees of freedom of your peptide. I mean, I will not too much bore you with the, with the details of this model, but um, it was quite complicated. But the good thing is that with such a model, you can relatively quickly model or, or simulate a large variety of sizes, of, of die positions, of tail effects, and so on. The final goal was, of course, that we have one model with only two parameters, which can reproduce all the rates and rate ADI that we have seen in our experiments. <laughs> And the challenges was, of course, that, uh, that we had an extensive parameter search. Of course, even with this kind of uh, core screen model, one simulation takes, takes a few hours. Um, we had uh, some, some, something uh, to take into account that also the closed state when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the peptide is basically uh, forming a loop, that this closed state has a different diffusion coefficient than the open state. And also that the rates depend on the contact radius. What is the contact radius? It would be the distance between di and tryptophan where quenching sets in. And this distance is not so super well known. However, fortunately for us, there is a very nice uh, experimented paper by, by, by uh, Marco Sauer and, and Smith. Um, they measured it uh, some years ago and they found uh, this 5.4 angstrom and we used in this contact radius for our, also for our model. So the results are shown here. In the end, we really could find then a consistent model, which is then consistently is, um, then reproducing all our experimental measurements, uh, the hydrodynamic radius dependency, but also the rate dependence on the contour length, even the tail effect was taken into account. And the results is shown here. So we found for the GS repeats that we have a persistence length of roughly five angstrom and the hydrodynamic radius per amino acid of 3.5 angstrom. Um, what was also interesting for us, we then checked out, for example, in, in this paper, you can read it up in detail, what, what is happening when we, when, we, when we switched off different effects like hydrodynamic coupling or excluded volume. What we found is that the excluded volume is extremely crucial for correct modeling of experiments and that the tail effect is coming in by basically an interplay between track and coupling um, into the dynamics of the loop formation. So uh, here I would like to make some a small um, intermezzo, and uh, which is cons which is basically related to this kind of fast confirmation dynamics measurement. This is, but this is only now 
somehow um, the very first uh, measurements what we did. So of course, I mean, this PET is very nice, but with PET, you can only uh, measure the loop formation dynamics. You know, you, that means you can only measure, okay, what is the chance that between a given position in your peptide and the die position, there is a full loop formation. And for really getting a full picture, you have then to move the tryptophan, tryptophan position through your peptide. And this is, of course, also somehow time consuming. You have to prepare all these different constructs and you have to measure them. Also, the measurement is relatively straightforward and relatively fast. Um, Fred, of course, for the resonance energy transfer, as we all know, is this in, in this respect much, much richer. We're giving you more richer data because you really get uh, continuous uh, information about the distances between your two donor and acceptor molecules. And <clears throat> one thing we wanted then to check out whether we can also use some idea which we developed currently recently in our lab for, for doing something similar. And this is called dynamic metal induced energy transfer spectroscopy. I have to warn you, it's only the very beginning, and I have to give you some background. What does it mean? So, what is metal induced energy transfer? So matter induced energy transfer uses the interesting effect that when you have a fluorescent molecule and you come close to uh, close proximity to a metal film like shown here, then what you will see is that in the near field regime, so when you are somewhere in the distance between zero and 250 nanometers, you see a super strong dependence of your fluorescence lifetime and also intensity on a distance of your molecule to the surface. This is Uh, also orientation dependent. This is similar to FRED. So what, what you see here are three curves. This is for a dye orientation, which is parallel to your surface, dye orientation, which is vertical to your surface. And the blue curve gives you for a random, for an iso, isotropic dye orientation. So we have used this in the past uh, in microscopy. So what we did, we wanted, for example, to measure very precisely the, 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 the basal membrane of the cell, uh, like shown here. So what we did, we are labeling the cell membrane with a dye, and then we put it here on, on, a, on a cover slide, which is covered with a very, very thin gold film. And then we use a relatively standard confocal microscope capable of fluorescence lifetime measurement, and then taking images of these cells and then converting the measure fluorescence lifetime at each position into a distance, we can come up with something like that. This is, uh, for example, here the mapping of the basal membrane of the cell. Of course, this has nothing to do here with dynamics of molecules, but the idea was, okay, can we use this, this principal effect also for measuring fast rapid dynamics of, of, of molecular constructs? And as a very first proof of principle, this is really ongoing. So this is, I can only show the very first proof of principle measurements. We were looking at something which is quite well understood and well investigated. This is the dynamic of these hairpins in DNA. So what we did is we prepared these kind of special samples where we have here an origami platform attached here on our gold coated cover slide. And on the platform, we have here a stalk, a double strand DNA poking out. And then at the end, there's this loop here, which can form a hairpin and has this, this very characteristic, uh, basically folding or unfolding or loop formation un, unlooping dynamics. So this is quite well understood and was extensively investigated also with other methods. And for us, it was a perfect model system for checking out our, our capability to, to use this might effect, this, this metal and energy transfer for measuring dynamics. This experiment now is very similar to FLAT. Basically what to do is instead of having here an acceptor molecule, the acceptor is replaced by this gold film. But the acceptor, but the donor is, uh, plays the same role as the classical thread. So the donor fluorescence is quenched partially by the, by the, by the metal film, which acts, acts as an acceptor. And this quenching is very strongly distance dependent. And you can use this now by either looking at the intensity fluctuations or lifetime fluctuations when, when your chain is moving up and down then to, to measure the dynamics of, of a single molecule. So we did it, and again, we use uh, FCS for, for looking at the temporal dynamics. So this is an FCX experiment now on such a, such a molecule on the surface in the presence of the metal. And of course, you see this intensity, then fluctuations, and the time constant of this partial decay of the correlation curve then is then giving you, in this case, the, the, the loop formation and loop opening dynamics. And what we find is then exactly the same numbers as people saw before for the same system. In this case, it's 1.2 milliseconds. 
So I hope that this method can in the future be some kind of a complement also to more uh, complicated thread measurements. The good thing is here that you only need um, one die and not a double die labeling. Okay. But let me come back to more classical FCS. So one thing I wanted to present here too, also today is, uh, is, is a method that should be called the fluorescence lifetime correlation spectroscopy. Again, uh, the topic is uh, how can we measure very fast uh, molecular or intramolecular dynamics? And um, this works again um, on, on, on two time scales. So when you do, uh, when we do our measurements, as I said, we always basically measure simultaneously not only the intensity traces of our, of our sample, but also the fluorescence lifetime. So we have basically two distinct time scales. One time scale, let me call it here T1, T2, T3, and so on. These are the detection times of our photons in our system uh, coming on a time scale between, let's say, microseconds to whatever hours. And then we have a second time scale, which is in a nanosecond time scale, which is, uh, is reflecting uh, the fluorescence uh, decay. So we are using pulse laser excitation, and then by a normal single photon counting, we then get these fluorescence decay curves. So why is it now important for, for FCS? Because what we then came up with is the following idea. Let's assume you have a sample where uh, your molecule or sample of interest shows two lifetime components. This is schematically shown here. So this is the lifetime curve in an nanosecond time range, and you have two components, A and B. One is a fast fluorescence decay, another shows a slow fluorescence decay. Let's assume it's the same, one of the same molecules in two different states. So if you, even if you, if you would then do the, something like a correlation experiment and only look at the intensity, you see something like a comp compound FCS curve, but it is not so super easy if the diffusion coefficient of E and B is basically the same, you cannot disentangle between these two components. However, that is the idea. What you can do is you can come up with something like a filter function in a nanosecond time range which is the, has the following idea. Let's just assume you, you do an FCS experiment and you are counting single photons. But before doing a normal standard two photon correlation analysis, as is shown here, what you do is you are rating, you are rating your photons with these bait curves. So let's say if you want to measure correlation between a short lifetime against a short lifetime component, before doing the correlation, you are multiplying your photon with, 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 with this kind of weight function, depending on the arrival time in the nanosecond time range. Or you can look, for example, on only the component B, B by weighting your photons with this red curve before doing the correlation. The nice thing is you can even do a cross correlation by, for example, doing the blue as a weighing the first photon with the blue curve and the second photon in your correlation analysis with the red curve. And I will show you in a moment why this is super useful and interesting. So in this way, by this kind of lifetime weighted progressive correlation, you can then disentangle the different diffusion components depending on their lifetime value. So this is schematically shown here. So as one of the, I think, very fascinating example, we studied the photophysics of enhanced GFP, which is one of the workhorses, of course, in, in all kinds of, of bioimaging and also spectroscopy. So eGFP, if you measure the fluorescence lifetime of eGFP in a normal fluorescence lifetime measurement, what you see is that you cannot really easily fit it with a mono-exponential decay function. You need a bi-exponential decay function to get a sufficiently good fit of your correlation, of your of your TCSBC fluorescence lifetime curve. So this is indicating that uh, GFP obviously has uh, basically two fluorescent states which have two different lifetimes. The, the question, of course, is, is it static? So we have simply one subpopulation of GFP molecules in one lifetime state and another subpopulation of GFP molecules in a different lifetime state? Or is it a dynamic process that simply you have some kind of conformational dynamics in your molecule, which is constantly switching between these two lifetime states? So for something like that, this FSCS is the perfect uh, method uh, for, 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 for of, of choice. So what we did is the following. 
We take our fluorescence decay curve from the GFP. We are doing um, also here cutoffs. So we simply cut off the, the, the scattering peak that we only have the tail of the fluorescence decay. And you see then these two components. We have a short lifetime component. We have a long lifetime component. And with this information, we can calculate then these filtering curves that we need for a lifetime specific FCS calculation. This is shown here. The blue is the, the, the filter curve, the weight curve for the, for the short lifetime, the, red, the, the green for the long lifetime. And we also take into account that you, that you can have some background, for example, from, from dark counts, electronic noise, or simply scattering. So with this, then we are going into experiment, we do normal FCS measurement, and then we uh, calculate lifetime specific correlation curves. And the result is shown here. So what you see here is instead of a single FCS curve, or what you normally would have without any lifetime filtering, we see now here four curves, because uh, the red one <coughs> is basically uh, the autocorrelation of the long lifetime component against the long lifetime component. The blue one is again, is, is the short lifetime component against the short lifetime component. And this is here shown in this kind of schematic. So what we assume is that we have these two conformations, these two conformers of the GFP one and two, they have different fresh lifetimes and we have also interconversion. And this interconversion, now you can see in the cross correlation. So what you see here is the cross correlation, the blue cross correlation curves of short lifetime against long lifetime photons and long lifetime against short lifetime photons, which are basically identical as it must be. And this kind of anti-correlation gives you the transition time between these two states. What we also have is a, is a transition from, from the state one into a dark state. This gives you an extra fast decay of all these correlation curves on the microsecond time scale. And this is due to protonation uh, and deprotonation of your, of your um, chromophoric center in the GFP. We then also compared our data with what is known from, from crystallography and indeed, the crystallography has seen that in the EGFP, you see two con conformers which uh, are um, connected with two different orientations of this uh, glutamate 222. In one conformation, you, you, this, this amino acid is forming a hydrogen bond with the serine here. In the other conformation, it is forming here a bond to the freonine 65. And this gives them rise to these two different lifetime states. And we also know that from this uh, conformation, then we can also switch into the dark state by protonation, deprotonation. And the good thing is that, for example, that we found also the occupancy rates from our measurements. So how, how often we are in the one and how often we are in the second conformation. This is perfectly matching what people have seen in X-ray crystallography. And I, was, I, I would say it was a very nice confirmation of our measurement. I, I think that it is, would be super hard to, to measure. Let me go back here one slide to measure this kind of very fast kinetics, as you see here, with, with, with other methods. So in, when, you, when you ever have some, some, some problem where you see this kind of very uh, fast fluorescence uh, lifetime fluctuation, then I think FSCS is the perfect method of choice to, to study this kind of kinetics between states. Um, with this, I'm at the last part of my, of my talk, and this is now going to rotational diffusion. It means now we are at the time scale of picoseconds to nanoseconds, where also again, FCS can be super useful. And why is rotational diffusion so useful? And, why I, and I think it's really underestimated in its uh, importance. I mean, as we started our talk today with, with, uh, with discussion of FCS for translational diffusion measurements, and of, as you know, and I simply implicitly always uh, use, use this relation, you have the Stokes-Einstein relation, which is then connecting the diffusion coefficient that you measure with FCS with the hydrodynamic radius. However, there is a sim similar relation when you look at the rotational diffusion of molecules. Let's say you, you have here a large protein and you look at its rotation, then you find the stokes einstein debye relation, which gives you the rotational diffusion coefficient as a function of the hydrodynamic radius. And the good news is that this dependency between the radius and the diffusion is much stronger. It's a cubic here, the cube of the radius, which is entering the diffusion coefficient, which means that in practice, if you could measure the rotational diffusion sufficiently precisely the, 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 the precision of the molecular size determination would be much, much better than with translation diffusion. So we were looking, okay, can we use FCS for rotational diffusion? Normally, what people do, and you all will know it, they use fluorescence anisotropy for measuring rotational diffusion of small molecules. However, when you are looking at something like a protein, a big protein, 
And rotational diffusion times are typically in the, in the order of, let's say, 30, 50, up to 100 nanoseconds, which is much, much longer than the typical fluorescence decay time. So for such a big entity, a normal fluorescence anisotropy measurement is basically impossible. So we were using then the FCS again for measuring this kind of relatively slow rotational diffusion. So what is the basic idea? It's again the same as before, FCS, fluorescence correlation. However, now what we do is we are using a, a polarized linear polarized laser. This is quite important. And as you will see also in a minute, we also use the lin as a polarized detection. So why can you measure rotational diffusion with FCS by using, let's say, a linear polarized laser? So the idea is the following. Let's say we are exciting our sample with a polarization, which is uh, oriented along the vertical axis here. And let's say what you see, this blue arrow is the, is the dipole transition moment of your fluorescent molecule, which has to be, of course, rigidly attached to your protein of interest. So in the beginning, let's say by, by chance, there is a good alignment between your dipole axis here and your laser polarization, and you have a high chance to see a photon from, from, from your molecule coming back. However, after some time, after a few nanoseconds, when this, this, the, the, the molecule is rotating, it is rotating out of your excitation polarization, which means that the chance to see a second proton is going with time down. That means what you would expect from such an experiment is a partial, again, decay of your correlation function due to this rotational diffusion. Um, we did basically then push this whole idea to the limits. So what we did is we used, again, Python elite excitation for getting the full picture. So we have here these two lasers, the Python interleaved manner. They have a formal polarization. And then we have also here four detectors, which then record all kinds of, of polarizations of our fluorescence light. And then we can basically calculate any kind of correlation curve you want. And what are the possibilities? I mean, what you have is you have basically uh, one slot here for the for the polarization of your laser and the polarization of your detection for the first photon, and again, the polarization of your laser and the polarization of your photo for detection for the second photon. In total, you would have 16 different combinations, but only four of them are indeed independent from each other, and this is shown here. So these are the four different possible correlation curves you can extract from such an experiment. This is a model calculation for typical rotational diffusion. Um, so we did it. So what we measured then um, was using the, 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 the curve, which gives you the highest the highest contrast. This is the, the curve where we have the first, uh, let's say, your orthogonal excitation, orthogonal detection versus parallel excitation and parallel detection polarization. And this is a typical correlation curve, how it looks like. Uh, you see these drives because we have a pulse excitation. This is simply the pulsing of our laser. But you see very nicely this anti-correlation, which is then directly connected to the rotational diffusion. And then we use this method for looking systematically um, and rotational diffusion of different uh, relatively big proteins. We use choose, uh, choosing here idolase of albumin and human serum albumin. Uh, one uh, peculiarity, of course, uh, what you have to make sure is that the dye you use for labeling these proteins is indeed co-rotating with your protein, not simply dangling on the linker. So we use this, uh, we use this bifunctional Psi 5 NHS ester for attaching this dye on both ends to the surface of the protein. This is quite straightforward. And then, of course, uh, what is also good with Psi 5 that, uh, that the decay time, the fluorescence decay time is much shorter than the laser repetition period. In this case, it was six nanosecond, so that you don't have interference between lifetime and rotational diffusion. And then we use that method and we measure the rotational diffusion, calculated then uh, the hydrodynamic radius. And the good thing is we could also compare it with our dual focus FCS measurement, which take much, much more, longer time. And you see the comparison between these three uh, proteins and the different numbers. And why do I show it to you? Because we hope there was one paper many years ago by Helene Davidovich, which was well, they're claiming that uh, due to very subtle uh, non, uh, non homogeneous viscosity, uh, of, of the solvent and, uh, close to the, to the protein surface, you could expect or there is some hope to, to see a difference in the rotational diffusion and the lateral diffusion. So the, the idea was that the rotational diffusion is slightly uh, slightly faster than the, the, the lateral diffusion. Within our measurement error, however, we see identical results, which is also an interesting scientific result. And a good thing, of course, for us was that we had also an independent confirmation
confirmation, confirmation again that our dual focus FCS is indeed a fantastically precise method for measuring um, diffusion. So this is all I wanted to tell you today. I hope it was not too technical for you and uh, I hope you could take something with you. I have to thank, of course, all my whole group, my, all my collaborators, collaborators here in Göttingen, also, of course, all the funders. And um, I, I thank you for your attention. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Eric, for this wonderful talk. And uh, of course, we have a lot of time now for questions. Uh, so we are going to start. The first question is from uh, David Nesbitt. David, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you. That was very, very, very nice. I, I'm, the question I have is about your modeling of the uh, FCS for fast interconversion with the dark state. And you had this model where state two and state one could interconvert and then state one could convert to this dark state. And I, yeah. you know, when one does these sorts of modeling, there's always the ambiguity as to whether or not two has to go back to one before it becomes the dark state or whether or not there's an, uh, another pathway entirely. So how, how does the model distinguish between uh, that other possibility? Yeah, I mean, um, in, in this FCS measurement, you will see it that, that, uh, that in, the, in the red, here in this red decay, you have an additional fast decay component, which is due to this transition between one and the dark state, which is absent in, in the blue curve. Yeah, I mean, of course, the, the measurement time to, 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 to squeeze it out is really, really long. Yeah, so that because you see that the, the, the noise is quite, quite largely because we have very uh, short correlation times where noise becomes more and more important. And also because this FSCS filtering is basically giving you not, not a very good signal to noise ratio. But I mean, in principle, what you see is that, uh, that, uh, that the, 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 and so if, if both these components, the so two and one, for example, would couple to the dark state, you would see the same fast DK component here in these autocorrelation curves. We only see it, or we think we only see it in the red curve. Of course, there's also some, I mean, that is coming from, from biochemistry. People simply tell us, okay, that this transition is here much more probable than coming from two to the dark state. Yeah. But uh, this is not uh, my, so my expertise. It is uh, what my, my biochemists tell me. Yeah. But in the measurement, you, you can squeeze it out from here. Yeah. No, that's, that's very helpful. So it really does come from your filter functions being able to yeah. de deconstruct the two uh, FCSs. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Yeah, yeah, think about, I mean, you know, this, this decay and also what you have is here, you have two, two transitions to the left, to the right. So that means you have here in this decay, you have basically two exponentials. Yeah? And the good thing is that you can, you can fix one of the exponentials using the cross correlation, yeah? And uh, then uh, the blue curve, you don't see the second exponential, which is due to the transition to dark state. Yeah? This is the idea. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pablo Caravilla. Pablo? Uh, yes, uh, I think you just answered my question. Fantastic talk, uh, by the way. I, I was wondering if in this exact uh, slide where whether you could explain why the model does not, the cross correlation model does not perfectly fit the, the data in the microsecond range, whether this is some photophysics that, that the model might be missing or, or if it's CSV to the signal to the ratio. You mean here? Yes. This, this, this range here. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, this is the, the scale. Also the problem is the, the, sh the shorter the delay time you want to determine a correlation function, the, the longer you have to measure be before the statistics becomes, becomes good. So uh, the measurement here took already something like two days, <laughs> nonstop. So yeah. something 40, 48 hours, yeah. And still, I mean, yeah, it is, it is still quite noisy. So I'm not sure whether this is really a systematic deviation or simply, uh, simply noise, yeah. So we would have to measure even longer times. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's what I say. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I mean, you're right. I mean, it is, uh, yeah, it is, we are coming isn't at some limit of, of, of measurement time. Yeah. Maybe we could optimize it by using higher concentration and so on, but that, that was the best we, we, we obtained at the time. Yeah. It is a drawback of FLCS, yeah? especially when the lifetimes are very close to each other. The closer lifetimes to each other, 
the more the more noisy your FLCS uh, uh, curves become. This, this is one of course of course of the limitations. Yeah. Okay, Tim Krugs. Hi there, thanks, uh, Jörg. This looks wonderful stuff as always. Um, I'm interested in just how you generate these weighting functions for the FLDS. If you could maybe go into a bit more detail. Yeah. And you've just touched on this as well there about how different do the lifetimes really need to be and how much error is introduced in getting these, you know, the, these, these functions right. Yeah, and so the, the functions are basically, so I, I calculate in a very deterministic manner. So what you do is, let's say you have here these two, and this, um, let me explain it here in the schematic. So we have here these two lifetime components, this is the blue one and this is the red one. Okay, these are the decay curves in you know, non-logarithmic and normal, the normal intensity here. And uh, the, the, the filter functions are chosen in such a way that but, 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 but when you do the following thing, when you are, multiplying point by point when you're multiplying the blue curve with the red curve here, you get a zero. So when you multiply point by point and summing up, yeah, so you take basically each lifetime value here, you multiply the, the filter fun the blue filter function, and you multiply it with the corresponding uh, intensity here in the fluorescence decay curve, then you sum it up, then you get identical zero. And the same thing for the red curve. When you take the red curve, and you multiply point by point with the blue curve here, and you sum it up, you get zero. So it means these, these weight functions are orthogonal to your fluorescence decay functions. That's the idea. Yeah. But, but, but they're surely not unique in function. I mean, how many, how many different ones can, will, will satisfy that, and how different are they? So we are using a so called, um, what is it called, quasi inverse matrices to calculate them. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, in that way, then it's, it's unique. Of course, you can, you can choose different algorithms. This is true, but I mean, the simplest what you can do is a quasi in, inverse, and then it's, it's, it's unique. Yeah, we never played around with any everything else because it worked quite okay. So what we do, for example, by simply checking whether this method is, is consistent, we use let's say we use as we use uh, pure dye solutions with different lifetimes, and then when everything works correctly, then you should see when you take the wrong dye with the wrong with the with the other uh, weight curve, then you should see a zero correlation curve. And indeed, this is the case. Yeah. So in this way, we are checking that everything works. Brilliant, thank you. Hey, Don Lamb actually has two questions. Right, two very quick questions. I mean, first of all, beautiful work, Jorg, and a nice talk. So uh, the first question would be for your persistent length for the uh, GS linker. I mean, we measured the persistent length in the maltose binding protein. We got about seven angstroms. Mm -hmm. So it's the five angstroms uh, for this GS linker, or have you measured in other proteins how accurate is the five angstroms? I mean, for the for the for the for the GS, the, the also, yeah, I, I would have to look up the paper, but the accuracy was plus minus one angstrom, and um, I mean the, the idea, the, um, yeah, the idea was that we had a really huge data set uh, which we could fit consistently with, with these two numbers. Yeah, the problem is. The problem was a little bit that they are interdependent. So when you when you wiggle a little bit with the persistence length and you wiggle a little bit with the hydrodynamic radius, you find you find the very well fit also for for different pairs of these numbers. So we did a lot of of, of bootstrapping and everything to find a really the global minimum for these two for these two numbers. But it's not completely in, in, independent. But I mean, this you can really look up in, in our paper. There is a huge supplement where we did this kind of analysis. Um, how to how to fix these numbers from 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 the modeling? What we also checked, by the way, this is I mean maybe then also referring to your to your measurements. We then tried to use the same model for FC repeat proteins. You have also huge like, data set of FC repeat proteins, and there we we saw that this, this these numbers don't fit anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously, okay. it really unfortunately, so we were hoping that maybe we can find something like a generic. Uh, model which is fitting all intrinsic disorder proteins if they have no intrinsic residual, residual structure. Um, I, I think that is un unfortunately not the case. So it really yeah. depends also on, on amino acid nature. Yeah. Right. No, I think the GS should be very flexible. So it's not that surprising. Yeah. But the other quick question you mentioned comparing the translational rota uh, diffusion and the rotational that you, the rotational should be more sensitive. Your measurements at the same error bars. 
Uh, was it similar to measurement times or are there much yeah. differences? Is the rotation really that much more sensitive? Yeah, um, um, yeah, good question. <laughs> You're right. Um, the, the point is, oh, sorry, this, uh, the point is, of course, that this measurement takes much more time. Yeah? So because you want here to, to calculate the correlation curve in the range of a few nanoseconds, so let's say up to 100 nanoseconds, this is the interesting part for the rotational diffusion. Here, the rotational diffusion of these coils in the order of 70 something nanoseconds. And that means the measurement time goes up tremendously yeah? to get us uh, to the same quality in the correlation curve as for the translational diffusion, we would need to measure 10 times longer. But, uh, but then, of course, you can pin down. I mean, a good thing with this rotation diffusion, that's why I also like it. Um, uh, even if you don't have a dual focus FCS system, uh, you can use this one because this is completely independent on the multiple detection function. Whatever your focus looks like doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah. So this, this, everybody who can do some kind of this measurement with polarization dissolved excitation detection can use rotation diffusion also as a calibration for, for standard FCS. Yeah? But, but you're right. Yeah. You, you pinned me down here. Yeah? So the, the error here is just similar to the error here. Yeah. Sure. Right. Thanks. So, Jörg, since uh, Don asked about the rotational diffusion experiment, so many years ago, Rudolf Riegler uh, 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 wrote about this uh, experiment in FCS, but then it always looked to me like it was an extremely difficult experiment. And of course, in your hands, it seems to be really nice and easy and uh, very beautiful signals and everything. So what's the difference? I mean... The, also the problem was, I mean, when Riegler was doing his experiments many years ago, then, then you having, having a measurement setup which can calculate or measure correlation curves on a nanosecond time scale was not easy. Ne? This, this is, also the, at, the, at the beginning, they used these hardware correlators and there was some time limitation at that time, whatever. So to, to access this very short correlation range in time, it was really challenging. Nowadays, it is, is a piece of cake right? because now we have these single photon counting electronics and then single photon detectors and so on. So nowadays, we're calculating a correlation curve from picosecond to seconds, this is a standard. The, the big difference here is really the measurement time yeah? the, because you really need a long measurement time to get a similar go to the single to noise ratio in your correlation curve at these short uh, correlation times and in long correlation time. But I say, I think this method is really underestimated because it is much easier than people think. Yeah, because what you need is a polarized excitation, uh, preferentially also polarized detection, and then simply some patience to measure. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And the good thing is, as I said, that this measurement is totally independent on the geometry and then focus quality, whatever. You can even use a, a flash lamp for excitation, doesn't matter. You have only to be patient enough to measure the correlation curve in a nanosecond time range, and that's it. We did even some really huge calculations at the time, by the way, to check out whether this depolarization of, of by high new, high NA objectives is affecting the quality of the measurement. It, does, it is not. So you can completely ignore all these depolarization effects by high NA objectives. They, they, they play a negligible role for the quality of the data. So um, I think still that rotation diffusion measurement is, is a very interesting uh, method, which is not used uh, as it should be. Okay, Sudipta Maiti. Hmm? There is a question from Sudipta Maiti. Hi, Jörg. Hi. Hi, good seeing you again. And fantastic talk as always. I had a question about your rotational polarization FCS. Yeah. Um, if you have a high NA objective, then yeah. you do get a, a, a dipole, a, a projection of the dipole along the axis of the beam. And uh, in your, when you say parallel and perpendicular, do you take care of the rotation from that axis to the uh, lateral yeah. axis? Yes, I just said, but we did when we, when we first published an hour, also this kind of measurement here, then we did a huge uh, number of also calculations to check 
We've got this kind of depolarization, what we just mentioned. Yeah, when you take a linear, linear polarized laser and you focus into a solution, you will also see, of course, uh, components along the optical axis. And you have even some components, uh, polarization components, which are perpendicular to the laser polarization. But uh, you, you can really neglect them. So we check whether this is somehow affecting the final result. The, the good thing with, with, with correlation with FCS is it's a two photon. Uh, two photon uh, correlation. It's a two photon correlation. It means, let's say, when you have something like 10% uh, no, nasty signal, let's say, yeah, then after correlation, the impact on the final FCS is only 1%. You see what I mean? That this is the point. So, I mean, and these, these, these other polarization components, which are not along the initial laser polarization, they are so small that after correlation, they are negligible. So this is good because it was a big, a big concern at the beginning whether this depolarization in excitation and detection, we have also in detection, whether this can somehow bias your measurement result. You can forget about it, I promise you. Yeah, we checked it. After actually putting a quarter wave plate, we do see the remnant of that effect a little bit, but I'll talk to you maybe. Yeah, but I mean for the, for the rotation diffusion times, yeah, this is not changing. Yeah, so I mean, what we do, of course, in the end, you only, you only fit the, the correlation decay times. No? And there, that plays no role. We checked it. And you can find it in the papers also. Thank you. Good seeing you again. Next question by uh, Timor Ten. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Jörg. Thank you for hi. sharing your excellent work. I just had a few quick Technical questions is that uh, did you say there are two lifetimes decays for the auto die? No, 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 no. I mean, the, this this two lifetime thing was G G G F P. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was here E G F P. Uh, no, no, no. Auto. Yeah. When, when you look at auto, that is a fantastic die. It's a perfect mono exponential fluorescence decay. And it is also basically negligible triplet state. Yeah, so when you use it for FCS, you only see the diffusion part, no triplet photophysics, whatever. That's really nice guy. Okay. And then uh, is the confocal volume always consistent from run to run? The what? Uh, the confocal volume. Is no, of course not. That was, okay. that's why we, we, we came up with this dual focus FCS because it is not. Oh. The good thing, I mean, maybe I didn't make it so clear. The good thing with this dual focus FCS stuff is the following. So let me simply show it here maybe again. <clears throat> so um, the, 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 the shape and, and size of your, of your focus here can depend on, on anything. Yeah? The, the, the refractive index mismatch, um, the cover slide thickness even, astigmatism, optical saturation, whatever. But the good thing is that the distance, the center distance between these two foci is, is not changing. So that means then, for example, when we, when we do this dual focus FCS measurements, and let's say we have huge aberration, whatever, this aberration is shifting all these curves to, to longer decay times, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but it does it for all the curves in the same manner. So by comparing the, the cross correlation decay against the outer correlation decay, and knowing then the center distance between foci, we can again recover then the diffusion coefficient, and we don't care about the precise shape and size of the individual foci. I see. Thank you very much. Next question by uh, Jens Michaelis. Hello, Jörg. Uh, thanks Hi. for a great talk. And uh, I guess you stimulated discussion on many, many different topics. Um, and so I, let me switch to a topic that hasn't been discussed in the discussion session yet, uh, that is the metal-induced quenching. Yeah. So, um, so uh, again, there could be lots of uh, complications, which you didn't allude to, uh, <laughs> one of them being, of course, polarization. And, and so it could be that the different molecules can be associated with different polarizations and, and, and or you could have jumps of a molecule in different orientational states. Yeah. Is there something that sort of fuzzes, uh, makes your data more fuzzy or, or you, it's not 
Apparently. Also, yeah. Also, if 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 your die uh, gets frozen into a specific orientation, it would be a huge problem for sure. Ne? So, what we are relying here on is that that our die is still flexible, flexibly connected to the to the you know, single strand DNA, and that we assume that you have still have rotational, fast rotational diffusion even in in the loop in the loop uh, of your die. So, we checked it here in this measurement. We checked it some about questions on an isotropy measurements. In And indeed, we don't see a significant fluorescence and isotropy even in a closed in a closed loop uh, situation. If this would not be the case, then it would be a problem because, of course, this metal induced energy transfer is heavily dependent on the orientation of your die with respect to the gold film. In a very similar as you what, what you have in thread with this orientation factor. The good news is to some extent that uh, here you only have to deal with the orientation of one die, not with two dies. So this, is, this means the, 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 the number of, of degrees of freedom is reduced. Yeah? But I mean, yeah, but this is an, indeed, this is, this is a big, uh, big thing. So for all the MITE measurements, what we do either for microscopy, but also here in, in dynamic MITE, we always check uh, the flexibility of the die by doing an fluorescence and isotropy measurement. Right, We have someone called Ben Schuller here who also has a question. I think I know the guy. You might know him. It's me. Hello. <laughs> yeah, really fantastic. It's so impressive what you've been able to do for FCS and with FCS over these years. It's really, it's so impressive. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, I have a question that we often uh, struggle with. Um, and as you know, we do a lot of measurements in the nanosecond range to investigate dynamics, mostly using FRET, sometimes also using PIP. Um, and one of the problems that we have that in many cases, um, there can be both rotational components and quenching components that occur on very similar timescales. Yeah. And so what we typically do just qualitatively is that we vary um, the, the correlation components between parallel and perpendicular to figure out whether it's predominantly quenching or rotation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get a clean answer, but sometimes you don't. And uh, I mean, most of the time we use uh, CW excitation because we, we, we try to avoid the pulse correlation functions in that range. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what would be your advice? What's the best strategy <laughs> to try and decompose these two components? <laughs> oh yeah, difficult question. I mean, the first thing, I mean, I would, so it is only gut feeling. I, I didn't look into this, this question really in detail, but my gut feeling would be if you do uh, simply an experiment where you have really the full polarization control, let's say you control the polarization as ex of excitation and also you do a polarization resolve detection in both channels, then from the full, how to say, Uh, set of, of measurement curves, you should be able to disentangle rotation and let's say some, something else. However, there can be one complication. I'm not sure, but this can be a problem that, that let's say the photo, that, that the, this fast component you, you are looking at can be also intensity dependent. Um, for example, when, when you would measure photophysics, yeah, let's say triplet state, intersystem crossing, whatever. And of course, this, the, 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 this photophysical uh, uh, kinetics is dependent on excitation intensity. And this is again dependent on the, on the, on the die orientation. Mm -hmm. So in such a case, you would have a coupling, a physical coupling between orientational the dynamics and the photophysical dynamics. And then it becomes super complicated. Yeah, and I don't have a simple answer how to disentangle that. I don't know whether this is somehow answering your question, but it could be one reason why in some experiment you, can, you see some kind of a coupling or you cannot clean, clean, cleanly disentangle both of them mm -hmm. because uh, when, when you something drive photophysically, then it also depends on the orientation because the orientation gives you the excitation um, efficiency, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, we seem to have one last question from Samane Revzani. Revzani. Yeah, thanks a lot for the nice um, presentation. Um, my question was uh, like somehow answered, but uh, the advantage of two focus FCS. Um, you mentioned briefly, but can you uh, explain a bit more? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> let me go. Let me go. 
get me the little back to this one curve. I can show you it in the beginning. So why did we do it? <coughs> the, the, the starting point for us was something like that here. Uh, <coughs> so this is an experiment where we have a pure dye, uh, Alexa 633. And we use here in this case, we use different excitation powers uh, for measuring the FCS. Ideally, so naively, at least in our case, we were thinking naively that you should see exactly the same fluorescence decay. And you see here, this is the long time decay in a millisecond time range, which is determined by the diffusion of your dye through your detection volume. So why uh, should the detection geometry and, and your diffusion coefficient, why should it depend on, depend on the excitation intensity? That was somehow a mystery for us before we realized that by pumping the dye with different excitation power, you saturate it more and more. And this is then apparently deforming your detection volume. And this is not only taking place, for example, when you use different uh, excitation intensities. This can also happen, for example, when you use uh, the free dye here, like this very copy, and you do one measurement of the blue curve. And then under identical conditions, you measure again, but now you have used Alexa 633 for labeling a protein, but this labeling is changing the photophysics of your dye. And again, you see, for example, suddenly the green curve. And you have no idea whether this shift here in your correlation curves is due to the slower diffusion of your sample molecule or due to some photophysics. And this is, this is the reason, I mean, in single focus FCS, um, the, 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 the diffusion decay here depends on so many other parameters except the diffusion coefficient that it is super hard to control. Even when you do calibration measurements and everything, so many different parameters influence your, your absolute decay of your correlation curve that, that it is really super difficult to make precise quantitative measurements. That's why we then came up with this dual focus FCS because as I explained, you will have to focus FCS is introducing an extrinsic uh, length scale as the distance between these foci, which is determined by this, this prism here, it has nothing to do with all these other uh, problems like, like refractive index mismatch, optical saturation, whatever. And this gives you then a much pre more precise and absolute quantitative measurement, let's say, when you want to measure diffusion coefficient or the size of, of molecules. That, that's the reason. It's an absolute mm -hmm. measurement method. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems like there are no more questions. So I would like to thank Jörg again for this two of the fourth through <laughs> molecule and fluorescence correlation methodology. That was really wonderful. And I'm sure all, all of us enjoyed it very much. And I see that many people stayed till the last question uh, to listen to all the details and and the small uh, technical issues that were discussed here. Uh, so thank you again, Jörg. And uh, in two weeks, we have a lecture by uh, Eugene Shaklovich. So I invite you all uh, to attend that lecture as well. So thank you and good night or good afternoon. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot.